Hello there and welcome back to the Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. <clears throat> now I know recently I was able to actually put together a sort of summary outfit for you all here on the channel, but really in secret, or not so secret honestly, I've still been working on some more retro futuristic color blocked weird shiny fabric panel dresses and I have one more of those for you today. It all began really with this particular textile. This is a four-way stretch spandex in a sort of raspberry burgundy color with an iridescent dots shiny foil finish on it and I just thought this colorway was so pretty this very uh, reddish purple color mixed with the iridescence and I thought I could pair this with another jewel tone so I decided to pair this with a dark red cotton sateen from Joann's and I wanted to make something over the top and kind of spectacular. I just think this colorway kind of demanded my like space queen beetle dress come to fruition. So that's what I have for you today. Here is my sketch. Of course, this design is inspired by 1950s images I had seen, sort of retro futuristic uh, images from the 50s and also that sort of mid-century modern atomic kind of future look mixed with inspiration coming straight out of the Thierry Mugler shows from the 1980s and 90s, of course, because Thierry Mugler was a genius designer as far as I'm concerned and his work is a huge inspiration to me and I love watching old Terry Mugler shows so this dress also is inspired by his work as well. So I'll show you what I mean, what I've got up to over on the blue patterning table of doom as always. All right here we are with our bodice blocks or with my bodice blocks. Use yours. <clears throat> uh, they'll, they'll work better than mine if you plan to copy this design but here I will trace my bodice block front here. And I will go ahead and draw my darts all the way to the apex because I am going to be moving them around today and put a half inch down the center front so that I can have a center front seam. And then I'm going to try and decide how deep I want my yoke up here. I just kind of wanted, a, wanted an almost epaulette kind of style short little yoke up here that my darts can go into. I will be moving both darts up into the shoulder up here, up into this yoke seam basically. And I've just grabbed my Pattern Making for Fashion Design by Helen Joseph Armstrong, this book here that I've been using since college that I had as my textbook back in my fashion school days and it says to come out a half inch at the shoulder seam and then down two inches along the center front neckline and create a curve between the two and I'm going to tilt this up to create the raised sort of tilted neckline here this isn't a separate collar it's just kind of a grown on collar or standing collar grown on standing collar kind of here so it just says to cut this apart and then tilt this forward about two inches so the space between where that is cut and the front neckline at the center front is two inches in here now tape this down. Basically this is just tilting the shoulder seam up an inch because she says add an inch here. Then there's a kind of a curve that goes here and that gets connected down. This creates kind of a funnel neck if you were to sew it together. Um, I don't really want my neckline at the center front to stand away from the body and be like a turtleneck in here. So I'm going to curve that back down into a little v-neck that I use quite commonly. I uh, wanted this top of this dress almost to have kind of a regimental or like almost a uniform kind of look and so I think having a little bit of a standing collar a very subtle bit of collar up here at the um, shoulder line helps with that. And then I will go ahead and move my darts up into the yoke seam here. I haven't even cut the yoke off yet. I want these to be sewn on the outside, meaning that the dart fullness, instead of being on the inside of the garment, will be on the outside external. Um, sometimes you see external darts in 1940s and 50s designs. I just think it can be a fun sort of extra textural detail, which is hard to say the word textural. And I can go ahead and just continue this line up here so that this tilts up with the neckline. Front yoke, this is the side, this is the direction it needs to be, this is the um, grain line on that, and I can go ahead and cut this apart. And of course, add seam allowance to both the bodice and the yoke so that it can be sewn back on later. So I'll go ahead and do that real quick here with some scrap of paper. Many scraps of paper created in pattern drafting. I keep a box from Ikea next to me to put all my scrap paper in so I can just call upon it at any time. But I'll cut down my dart legs and then I'll cut down where I want them to be, where to, I want to move the darts to, like so. So I'll go ahead and close this first one, the waist dart, and move that fullness up into that yoke, shoulder yoke uh, seam. And I want to make sure that when this is folded closed, that it doesn't overlap the other dart too much. I'm hoping to have space up here, basically, for both of my darts to be next to each other and sewn externally without having to be tucked into any other seams. Um, so. Hopefully that makes some sense. So I'm folding the dart fullness as if it will be sewn on the outside of my garment like that. And I'm thinking I might have to move this over a little bit. So I'm closing it up for now. <sighs> but let's just fold this closed and cut it, kid. I'm moving this dart. I want to see, uh, I'm removing that dart and then folding it to see how much dart fullness needs to fit in here. And it looks like that will fit in here with the seam allowance. So should be okay. Whew. I'm going to come up from the uh, apex an inch and a quarter. Honestly, when I'm putting the darts up into the shoulder, I usually can leave the apex a little bit 
uh, or get closer to the apex. I need to actually modify that um, just because for whatever reason, when I have my darts on the top half of my bodice, I can make the darts a little bit pointier or the apex a little bit, or come closer to the apex, I, be, I guess. And then I'm going to go ahead and close this side dart and open that up into the second dart up here and hope that when I fold everything closed, everything will work up there. I'm not overlapping very well here, so I'm redoing my overlap. Fill this in with some paper. This one's not big enough. There we go. And then again, I will fold this as if shut and cut the excess off to get the correct shape on that. I am going to draw my new dart legs here again, an inch and a quarter up from my apex. Should have done five eighths, which is the standard recommendation, but I usually do more just because that's usually what I need. But when the darts are in the shoulder, I can go closer to the apex is what I'm trying to say. All right, so that folded closed. It looks like it should be okay in the arm side. It's really close. And uh, when I end up sewing this, it's honestly too close. I should have moved these over a quarter of an inch, but oh well. So with those darts folded closed, you can see we've created the cone for the bust here, and then this will be sewn up into the yoke like so, so that the darts will be external like this, kind of flaps on the outside. Again, just adding a bit of texture to the top of this garment because there's so much going on elsewhere that it's kind of nice to have um, something going on up here in the shoulder instead of having it be plain, I suppose. And then I'm going to draw in my sort of corsety waist yoke thing. It's like a faux underbust corset is what I think of this style line. Whenever I add this in, that's kind of what I'm after in some ways. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and cut that apart. And of course, that's right, add seam allowance. Now, one side of this you can see is in the, in the sketch here up in the right ha is like a stripe and the rest is back to red. And the other side is all iridescent is what that green is representing. So uh, here I have the full side, but I also need to create like I need to create a left and a right for this particular piece. So I'm going to trace another copy of that exact piece like so. It'll be sewn on here and I'm going to draw my seam allowance in so I can see it and then draw an inch away and this little stripe here that you can see on the left hand side of the drawing, um, which will be on the left hand side of my garment as well, is going to be a one inch stripe in here in which again, I need to add the seam allowance, that's right. You know me and my color blocking, just constantly cutting my pattern apart and then adding seam allowance so I can sew it back together. So one side is full, the other side has this little stripe. And this I'm just labeling, this is gonna be the shiny fabric, this is gonna be the shiny fabric, and the rest will all be solid red, like so. Set that front aside for now and get started on the backs. Once again, I want to reference what the book said for the back of this kind of raised neckline. And really it just, it seems like I could just trace the front. So I just tilted up at the shoulder like this, tracing the front, and then continued this down into the back neckline. Uh, I'm not sure if that's exactly how it's supposed to be done, um, but this worked fine enough for this garment. And my neckline on my uh, back of my block is always low anyway, so I always end up raising it. But I'll draw on my back dart here, even though I am going to separate this into princess seams, although I wish I didn't, because in the end, resulting dress, it's pulling kind of funny. I don't know if I should have interfaced this piece, but uh, on both dresses, I've used a similar back to this, like this one. I mean, I made another one recently that is extremely similar to this. Um, they just, the side pieces ended up looking gathered on the body. And I don't know if that's my posture or what's going on there, but I am having some trouble with this particular back princess seam. I don't know why. Um, so I'll have to work on that. I'm just gonna add seam allowance to this. This is the one part of this dress that I'm not super happy with, I should say, is the back, the side back for some reason. Huh. But here's the center back and here's the side back. I needed to like, I guess because when I round off the very end of the dart, I'm adding a tiny bit to the length of this, but only a tiny, tiny bit. So I don't know why it's coming out so puckered. Investigations for the future. I think my back of my pattern might just be a little long, which is something I've noticed in some of my other dresses as well. Like if I'm not standing perfectly straight, it does wrinkle and bunch up in the back a little bit. So I think I need to shorten my back pattern, possibly. Always constantly refining fit over the years because of course my body constantly changes because I'm a human being. <sighs> it's a shame. And of course, I'm always learning more and getting better at notice these, noticing these things and hopefully fixing these things, hopefully. But here I've just added that same sort of raised detail to the side. Back here, I didn't want this to go all the way to the center back because I don't want to have seams intersect my center back because I'm going to have a zipper in my center back. And the less I have going on there, the better. And so I can keep it simple down the very center back where the zipper will be. But I will still have this same sort of detail continuing on from the side seam. Um, this will line up along the front, and then here I'm trying to figure out left and right so I can do this correctly for the back, um, which is a struggle for me, sadly. Oh, and the air conditioner, compressor, something just finally turned off. So if you hear less background noise, that's why. All right, so I'm going to, again, trace this side back piece and then make another one for the other side that is a one-inch stripe 
off the top of this. So if you saw what I was doing in the front, hopefully this makes sense. Again, I'm just tracing another one for the right-hand side of the back to be the full side, actually. And then I will cut the original piece, uh, the stripe, into the original piece. Because the stripe plus red is on the left-hand side, and the full iridescent waist pieces are on the right-hand side for this particular garment. I just decided to do that because I wanted the peplum to be on the left-hand side, because I figured I would usually be carrying something like a handbag or like using my right hand. So that peplum would be in the way on that side. I don't know if I'm thinking about that oppositely. I'll find out when I wear this dress out, you know? I'm just adding seam allowance to that piece as well. I am just gonna use my regular pencil skirt block for this. I will just narrow the sides a little bit and I'll just fold the pattern in along the side to do that. But here I'm going to draft the peplum from this. So I'm just using my pencil skirt front here. I'm tracing up to the first dart. I will put an awl in the point of that dart, close it, trace up to the next dart, put an awl in the point, and connect that up so I can have basically a the top of an A-line skirt here. Um, this is just how to make an A-line skirt pattern, but of course I'm only making the first like foot of it, like the first 12 inches or so. So I can create a front peplum pattern. And I do want to have a two-layer peplum here, one with iridescent and another with the red, and I will line the red with red and the iridescent with red as well. So it'll be uh, three layers of sateen and one layer of the spandex here, so this is going to be quite thick. I actually did make this, pin it on, and then try on the bodice with just the peplum, like kind of pinned in place to see if I liked it or if it was gonna be too thick. And I think it just barely worked, luckily enough. From the hip down, I'm gonna flare this, but in the end, I actually end up attaching the back and front peplum. So I'll show you what I mean when I get to that. But this is the under peplum, this is the larger one. I'm trying to like hold a measuring tape up to my hips and figure out how long I wanted this to be. I'm just making it up, you know, there's no official doctrine here. I really am just flying by the seat of my creativity here. What do I want to do? I want this to come to the center front. That's about all I knew. Um, and in the back, I only need it to come to the like same area as where the side back is. So instead of coming all the way to the center back, I'm just following along with that waist piece again. Here I am just using my special magic A-line skirt method here. You can see this method to full effect in the A-line skirt video, by the way, which I can put a card up to here. But yes, I didn't want this back peplum to come all the way to the center uh, back. So I just have this come away a little bit. It will overlap a little further than the waist piece, but I thought that would be okay. And I've decided here, do I want to just combine these pieces and have less bulk because of seams coming together at the side seam? Because if this is going to be three layers of sateen, one layer of cotton of um, spandex, it's going to be a lot of seam bulk right here in the side seam that will be then also attached into the side seam of the bodice and the skirt of the dress. And it's just going to be so much bulk right here. So I've decided that I need to eliminate the seams in the peplum so that at least it's four layers of fabric that are smooth that's being sandwiched into the side seam area instead of four layers of fabric that have a seam in them as well, so it's double layered. Hopefully you can kind of tell what I mean if you've made anything with layered layers of the waist, I guess. Um, so I've decided to combine these and it will just flare extra from my hip and like stand away from my hip, which is how my sketch is drawn anyway um, and is like the, the theatrical kind of Mugler-esque idea of the whole thing anyway, so yeah. Honestly, I'm not sure if this makes any sense. I'm just combining my A-line skirt pattern front and back along the side seam. I'm lining that up at the waist and then any flare in between, like any space in between the front and back becomes extra flare at the hip. This will stand up and away from my hips, just like the sketch shows. I'm actually holding that up to my body now to see if I like the shape we have going on and if I think it will work. And I've decided that it should be okay. Um, this is gonna hold its shape pretty well because it's sateen, which is a pretty uh, stiff fabric. If you had something very floopy and you weren't interfacing it in any way, this would fall into like circular kind of ruffly folds. If I really wanted this peplum to be very sharp like this, I could have interfaced this as well. But again, it was already going to be bulky. I didn't want to go for that. I did decide to shorten this a little bit after holding it up to me. So I went ahead and did that. And I decided I really liked the length it was at now. So I just added on a half inch of seam allowance so that this would be the finished edge length. The, that one that I had held up would be the finished edge length as opposed to lose another half inch to seam allowance. So I did trace another copy of that and then make it a little bit shorter to be the top layer of this peplum. I forgot that I wanted to bring it in at the front and back as well um, so that there was another inch or so showing. So I'll do that later. I am just gonna flare this a little bit extra again at the hip. It's already quite flared, but I'm just gonna add in another half inch here just so this sticks up away from the body a tiny bit more than the layer underneath it. Um, again, this is kind of more advanced geometry, I suppose, but you know, I'm still not doing any math here. We can see I'm just winging it. But there are my peplum patterns. And I have to make sure I'm cutting out the correct side of these things when I go to cut out my fabric later because sateen does have a side 
and the shiny stuff definitely has a side. So I am going to grab a sleeve pattern that I've already made, but I will jump back in time and show you how I made it. This is a sleeve that I made recently for a dress I made over on Patreon in black cotton sateen and neon taffeta, but I'll go ahead and jump back over to past Patreon me to tell you how I'm going to make this sleeve. We're actually going to start with the sleeve here today. It's actually the most different thing about this dress, perhaps. And I've just got a tracing of my regular sleeve block here, and I'm straightening off the sides. So I'm just straightening down from the underarm there, um, because this sleeve is slightly tapered normally, but I'm just straightening that off and making it 27 inches long on each side, just as a base. Um, I'm going to be changing the length of this a lot later, but just squaring everything off. And then here in the back, I will go ahead and flare that about another 2 inches, or at least 2 inches down to the 27. I'm not being very specific about this, because I'm eyeballing it, let's face it. I'm then going to draw a line three inches out from the center towards the front of the sleeve. This is where my sleeve is going to have a split in it later on, so I'm just going to mark that split, and it will be cut open, and I'll need to add seam allowance there later. And I'm going to come out again another three inches from that center line down the back side of the sleeve here, so I can add a little bit of flare in the back as well. But let me go ahead and cut this out, so I can start shaping things. Again, this is kind of like a big rectangle right now, but I need to add some flare in here. And I am going to separate this down the center line and add a good uh, two inches at the top and then flare it additionally from there. So I'm taping on some paper here. I'm going to add two inches at the center of the sleeve at the top there. So I'm just going to mark that with my two inch wide ruler really. And then I'm going to flare from there down. So you can see here I'm adding a little bit of flare down that center here as well. So it's about four inches at the hem of where my sleeve is right now. So this is a little bit flared. But I'm adding two inches down the center so that I can have this be a bit of a puffed sleeve as well. Not official way of doing a puff, but it will work for this giant sleeve. These are just giant, huge, like fantasy bat sleeves, honestly. So, you know, can really do what you want. And then the last bit of flare I'm going to add in here, along that three inch, uh, three inches out from the center line towards the back of the sleeve. This is the back of the sleeve I want it to be where most of the fullness hangs. So I'm going to go ahead and add in a good six inches plus back here. Again, you don't see me measuring that. As I'm taping this down, I'm just adding in a good wide hands width of fullness down here. I'm going to measure it for you here. Six and a half? Yeah. And this is about four inches. And up here, of course, it was only two. Um, so again, just flaring the bottom of the sleeve. It's a bell sleeve, really. Um, but a giant one. And then I'm trying to figure out how to do the hem like this, because uh, I want it to point down in the back. But really, I need to cut apart my sleeve at the split before I can do this. So just like I did the bishop sleeve uh, for that dress last month, I'm going to cut this down the split of the front of the sleeve and then tape this other like front underside section to the back underside section so I don't have to have an underarm seam anymore because I'm going to have the split in the front anyhow. But in order to do so, I'm going to layer that um, seam allowance on the underarm seam. So let me just mark that seam allowance here along my underarm seam. And then I will cut this along the split so I can get a better idea of what the heck I'm actually doing before I draw my hem. So let me layer this. This again is the underarm seam of the front and back of my sleeve. Normally this would just get sewn and you would have a seam down your underarm uh, kind of area, but I'm going to go ahead and overlap that and tape that closed. So now I don't have a seam down there, I just have the split in the front. So this is under here and this is the front on the other side. And so now I can draw in the rest of this pointed hem. It kind of points down the center flared bit of the sleeve. You could draw your point in whichever which way you would like. If you want it to be longer in the front, longer in the back, if you don't want to have it asymmetric like I'm about to do at all, it is up to you, as most things are. And I am making this extra long because it's not going to end. I mean, it's going to, my hand, hmm. you'll see why in the end. Let's just go with that. <clears throat> here I am taping some extra paper at the sleeve cap here, where I had added in that two inches in between for a little bit of puff. And then I need to raise the sleeve cap as well for creating a bit of puff at the sleeve. So I'm raising that about an inch through the center and then tapering that down either side. And that is where I'll put my gathering in to have this be a puff sleeve later on. And then I'm just adding seam allowance back in because, of course, I overlapped the seam allowance of the underarm seam, so now there is no seam allowance on this. And I still need to hem these split edges. Uh, I don't really need to sew them together because this will be split open for most of the sleeve, um, or left open for most of the sleeve, I should say. But I will need to hem that edge still, so I need that half inch there, like so. And then I am taping down my flukes here. I'm going to pinch this sleeve together. Oh, I'm just remarking my underarm seam like a notch and then uh, my center of my sleeve. So I know those later. Neon bell sleeve, that's right. Um, I'm going to hold this up like how it will be eventually sewn and hold it up to my arm and see if I like the shape, if I think it's long enough. I want it to do something 
quite dramatic for this, so I ended up adding on a little bit of extra length to this point. It was just a little too tame, um, <clears throat> which this is an absolutely giant sleeve, so seems silly to say, but, uh, you know. I am keeping it about 23 inches above my hand, um, just so that when my hands are down, I think my fingers still stick out the top, like the front of this sleeve. Tape down my floops again, and that will be my oversleeve pattern. And if you wanted to do undersleeves, uh, actually this one, I left the undersleeves off. I did them separately, which I'll talk about at the end of the video. Um, but I would use the same undersleeve pattern that I used for that dress for last week. And about that undersleeve, it is just the regular sleeve that I started with for that last one, um, just tapered further. So I just tapered it to about half an inch less than the measurements around my arm as you go down the arm, uh, so that it would be a little bit tighter because I'll be using that four-way stretch fabric with the undersleeve so I can use something um, or use something a little bit slimmer because I know that there will be stretch in it and I want it to fit quite closely. Um, so it's tapering down from my normal sized like arm side I guess or sleeve cap at the top and it just tapers down quite quickly down into a narrow sleeve. Um, I just measured my arm to be able to do that like at several places along my arm to know how to taper it down and if you got it a little bit off it would be fine honestly. Um, again four-way stretch fabric very forgiving but you want to keep the sleeve cap the bend along the top, the bends along the top the same. And here is that fabulous fabric that inspired me to make this dress in general. This dress wasn't even on my video schedule. I, I just moved things around because I had to make it after I saw this fabric. Um, it doesn't look as pretty here on camera as it does in real life. I, I think it's, you know, it's fine and kind of iridescent and beetly here on camera, but it's even better in real life. And I was seeing how it would look as the sleeve and I thought it would look quite nice curled like that. It looks kind of flat when it's flat, but once this takes on any sort of curve, you can see the purple iridescence to the side, which is quite nice. But I will go ahead and cut out all the pieces I wish to be shiny from this fabric. I can use a single layer for this. I cut out, of course, two of the undersleeves um, or anything that I needed a mirror of, but most of these pieces for the shiny, I only needed one. That's why I was being very specific and careful to cut out the lefts and rights properly or the correct thing to face up, if that makes any sense, because I needed to not mess that up. I only had a, so much of this fabric as well. And this was when I realized that I wanted this top peplum to come in on the sides as well, um, or like away from the center front and center back further. So I'm gonna come in here and take a little bit off. So I'm gonna come in here and take a little bit off the front and the back as well, just so that the peplum peeks out, the bottom peplum peeks out from this. And I was just referencing the side back to decide where I wanted the top peplum to end um, in relation to the side back panels of the waist or above the waist. Again, I'm making these decisions on the fly, so it's hard to come back in here and explain later because it's like, I'm just kind of in my flow state over here when I'm doing something like this in a much more creative kind of project. And I'm sorry, people are making so much noise in this house right now. It's 10.42 PM, you would think they would calm down. And I'm just refining that shape a little bit further before I cut out that top peplum out of the red sateen as well. But now you can see it's kind of a stepped look there. And I might as well just draft my facings while we're here. So I'm just going to tape my front pieces together here. You can see I have my um, yoke taped back onto the bodice overlapping the seam allowance so that I can trace the neckline onto a piece of paper here and make some quick facings. Again, I like to make my facings two and a half inches wide at least. I think I went for three here just because I knew this neckline was a little bit raised. So I wanted to have a little bit further inward towards my shoulder for anchoring it. Hopefully that makes sense. And I will do the same for the back. Just taping this back together. This one really don't even need to, um, but then just tracing this so that I can finish my neckline with facings. And I'll just cut these out and then cut them out of the sateen as well. And just like I do for most of my color blocked things you've seen me do here on the channel, I cut out sateen for underneath the four way stretch on this. So this piece here under my arm uh, on the left hand side, that is a piece that has been flat lined. So the four way stretch has been flat lined onto sateen by serging the raw edges together. So that's just how I go about finishing those. And then I can go ahead and mark my darts on my front pieces here. You can see I've surged the raw edges of most everything else. Um, I didn't surge the neckline on this just because it would be fully encased in the uh, facing and I didn't want to add any more bulk in there. Um, it'll be no problem up in the facing. It'll be quite tucked in there. So I'm not worried about it fraying and setting doesn't fray too badly anyway. Um, and then I'm just marking my darts here on the fronts before I, and I'll sew the darts actually before I surge the raw edges of this just because I like to baste the dart fullness down when doing that. And I am marking this these darts on the outside of the fabric because I'll be sewing these darts on the outside of my fabric. And I will, you know, if you have watched me sew a dart before, you know how I sew off the end of my darts and then I tie the threads shut. Um, to 
facilitate having darts on the outside like this, instead of tying my threads into a knot at the end of the point on the outside, I will feed my threads back through the point to the underside and then tie them off using a needle. So hopefully I got footage of that. I'm not quite sure. We'll, we'll see when we get there. And then here's my pencil skirt. Again, I just folded the side of my pencil skirt pattern in about two inches from the bottom, uh, like from the hip down to the hem so that I could have a narrowed pencil skirt. It's not very, you know, fancy. Um, but I'm just marking my darts because I'll need to sew all my darts for my front and back pencil skirts, of course. So I can do that as well, just with colored pencil. But yeah, I decide if I want my pencil skirt to be straight or narrowed on the fly, uh, you know, when I go to cut it out. So I just take my regular pencil skirt pattern and fold from like the hip, like the uh, mid hip down to the hem. I just fold it in a little bit if I want to have it narrowed. I just fold the front and the back the same amount, basically. Um, so I don't have a separate pattern for a narrow pencil skirt and for a straight pencil skirt. I just decide these things as I go along. But I will mark and pin all of my darts for the skirt here and set those aside. I will be throwing the skirt together mostly off screen just because you've seen me make many a pencil skirt here on the channel. So you get the very, you know, the idea. If you'd like to see me make a pencil skirt in its entirety, you can watch this video here where I go through how I would sew one uh, in more detail, I suppose. But the skirt of this is the less intense part, let's face it. Onto the sleeves, the more epic part of this. Now this is a sheer, plasticky, polyester, well, I mean barely polyester. I'm sure I might be nylon, honestly. I'm not sure what the like iridescent threads are made out of. But once again, this is a plasticky sort of tinsel thread made out of like, I don't know, stuff that should be party decorations or something. Um, this is an organza I found on Etsy. I can link it below. It does come in multiple colors. This is the green colorway. But when held over the red, it was very similar in color to the four-way stretch I was using. So I thought it would be a good match. And I didn't want to have to hem these sleeves. Um, so I decided to line them in this weird organza. I figured this dress was already going pretty intense. So might as well just continue how mad things were getting by having the sleeves be lined in iridescent organza. You know? Why not? And I wanted to, I wanted to keep things washable. So the uh, cotton that I'm using here, I have pre-washed and then everything else is like a polyester or a, um, something that shouldn't shrink, I suppose. And that is true of this organza as well. As long, as long as I don't wash this in like super hot water, which I would not intend to. I would only ever wash this dress on like the delicate cold cycle or hand wash it anyway. Um, but I like keeping things either dry clean only or washable. So, um, keeping the sleeve lining, like you could use a thin silk, but then suddenly you've got a dry clean only situation in your hand, you know? So keeping things kind of consistent in that way, I find helpful. And here are my undersleeves. Again, these are just, you know, for my cap tapered to my wrist. And I will sew these together and they fit closely, but not like very, very tight. Just utilizing the four-way stretch of this fabric to my advantage eh, for the sleeve, if not for everything else. Everything else, I flat line it, of course, and a woven, but here for the undersleeve, I'll let the knit do its thing. And this is, again, kind of like an athletic or sportswear, dancewear kind of fabric. Um, I wouldn't mind having a swimsuit out of this. It would be very intense. And here I am laying out the back pieces. So you can get an idea of what that looks like before I've surged things. I'm just kind of laying my puzzle pieces all out and um, like face up so I don't get turned around and confused because especially with something like this where I'm trying to have the fronts with a little stripe and then the solid side match up with the backs that have the stripe and the solid side. So um, the stripes are on the left as we're looking at this and the, um, or in general, the stripe is on the left and the full lower sides of iridescence are on the right. So just keep trying to keep that straight. But again, I'm just flatlining those iridescent pieces to 13 under layers over here on the machine or on the serger machine. This is just a little brother serger, a baby lock or whatever they call them. Uh, this one doesn't have a blade. I have had it, people ask me why I don't just fix the blade. It's because I don't need it. So it's, this is all I ever use the serger for is to flatline things or to finish my raw edges. So it's doing the job I need it to do just fine as it is. And I can go ahead and start sewing my sleeves together. I don't know why I wanted to start with the sleeves on these epic sleeve dresses. I've I felt like I guess I just needed to try it and hope that it worked, especially because I'd never worked with this organza before. And I have worked with other iridescent organzas that were a nightmare. And this one is much easier to sew. So if you've been looking for a gossamer dragonfly wing fabric, I have the one for you. This one's much easier to work with than others that I've tried. But I'm just sewing the top six inches of my sleeves closed. Um, it will be split from here uh, down to my wrist. But the top of these I like to close up just so that 
The split is more of a surprise coming down from the cap, you know? Makes the sle sleeves easier to set in this way as well, because at least the sleeve cap is all closed up as it would normally be, the same size it would normally be. But this will have a little bit of puff at the top of the sleeve as well, just to add a little bit of bulk up there where I would like it. And honestly, if I slipped shoulder pads into these dresses, maybe the backs, the side backs would sit nicer. Here I am ironing my sleeve seams. I did just use straight stitch on this knit because it's not going to get a ton of stress and it should be fine in there. And uh, I will go ahead and press open my seam, like my uh, tiny start of a seam on this, again, very gossamer iridescent organza. It's a very fun fabric, let's face it. I have actually quite a lot more of this because I sort of want to make a trench coat out of it and it's very inexpensive. So I've never made a trench coat. I've never made a coat, honestly, but I think it could be quite fun. So we'll see if that ever happens. But I am just going to be fully bag lining both the left and right sleeve with its iridescent interior, I suppose. And then I'll be turning them right side out. And then at that point, I will serge the top sleeve cap areas together um, and like kind of finish it by flatlining the top seam. But this is just gonna be slipped inside of here, right sides together and sewn all the way around the edges, basically bag lining it, like I said. And it will have this absolutely absurd iridescent interior to my sleeves which gives a quite dragon queen sort of weirdness look later so i'm happy about that honestly i originally was not planning to do this but i realized oh i don't really want to have to hem these sleeves so i better figure out a different solution and that was to line them like i had done with my neon dress i was talking about earlier um, i had lined the sleeves for that dress in a neon yellow taffeta and uh this time we're going with sheer iridescence i think it's again a good color dupe for the four-way stretch having this uh cherry dark cherry red fabric underneath the green iridescent fabric it looks quite a lot a lot like that four-way stretch so here's that and i can take it over to the machine and start stitching i'm just using my half inch seam allowance as usual i'm starting a little bit down from where the join is from where the top of the sleeves are sewn together and i can just slip stitch the gaps once I turn these right side out later, which I haven't actually even remembered to do yet. This reminds me, I have not actually even slip stitched that area. It's just held in place by the nature of being pressed nicely. So I'll have to get in there and fix that. Again, I'm getting to a corner. I'm putting, leaving the needle down, putting the presser foot up, turning the project, pressing foot back down, keep sewing. That's just how I always get around corners, including for these giant sleeves. But you can call these bell sleeves or like fantasy style sleeves, but really like to me, they're almost like bat wing or like folded dragon wing sleeves and I think later when you see them on you'll know why but here I am clipping those corners being very careful to clip the um sateen normally and the uh iridescent stuff very gently uh because ugh, I feel like it would fray apart very easily and you have to be careful with it but let me turn this right side out and then I can start lining up the sleeve cap with the sleeve cap with itself now I guess see what I mean push this back up in here It'll line up and this is all very jellyfish looking, but I can press it into submission with my iron here. But again, you can see how this takes on a very purple sheen because of the red shining through it. So it still has all the same sort of colors of iridescence that the rest of the dress will have accented as well. Thought it was actually a pretty good match, but I'm just pinning the tops together here. This is what I was talking about. I will go ahead and run this part through the serger so that this lining is flat lined to the sateen up along this sleeve cap. So when I gathered the sleeve cap later and set this into the bodice, it will have a finished edge as opposed to being able to fray up here as well. And I can go ahead and finagle my corners and press everything nicely and smoothly, being careful because of course, I'm using a knitting needle on my corner here. Again, be really careful with that because you'll punch right through that organza, no problem. Um, but being really careful with my iron here, of course, as well, because this thermoplastic weird iridescent stuff will melt. So I had to be quite careful. Uh, so the cotton needs, can you know deal with a very hot iron, but this ar organza not so much. But then I can start sewing all my sections for my color blocking together. We've seen me do this several times at this point, um, but I'm going to also sew my darts for the front here, which we've also seen me sew many a dart, but here I am sewing them. They're on the outside, like I said, very exciting. I used uh, Taylor's chalk for these because I wanted to have something that would rub away quite easily. 
but I'm going to grab a random sewing needle that's sitting here in one of my pincushion tomatoes, take the ends of my thread, thread those through, and thread this back through to the underside through the point like so, boop, like that, and then I will tie off my dart, just tie these um, threads together a couple of times, like I normally tie off my darts, just on the inside so that my threads will be on the inside here. I always cut these to about an inch long and they just hang free on the inside of my garments. I've never had one cause a problem, you know? But as that is my regular dart method, I still use it even when I'm sewing my darts on the outside of my garments like this, which again is just a style decision to add a little bit more texture up here with these uh, funny darts. But again, I'm just starting to do my color blocking here. So I've sewn my one inch wide stripe of the iridescent to the lower part of the front here on this side. So I have my stripe. You can see the iridescence has much more of a effect once the piece starts to curve, which is why it works well on a body, because of course bodies are rarely, you know, square uh, or flat. They're much more curvy. I'll set this back next to the machine so I can do some top stitching on this as well, as I'm prone to do with my color blocking, as we know. And then I will grab my front darted pieces here, the top of my fronts, start pressing those using the end of my ironing board here, as well as the tailor's ham, just to press those as they need to be before I can sew them to the yoke eventually. But now that they are surged, I can go ahead and sew them to those lower fronts that are also surged, but for a different reason, and sewn together at this point. So I can stitch these, set that next to the machine, post pinning, so that everything is ready to go. And then I will go ahead and press my skirt darts that I sewed that last round as well. And you can see the center front of my skirt here was cut on the fold, and it still has that fold in there, so I need to press that out as well. This fabric is still a little bit wrinkly from even being in the dryer, even though I did press it before I cut things out. It's just lots of pressing, you know, and sewing. Over here on the machine, I can go ahead and sew what I had just pinned. So the lower, like, waist yokes of the front to the top of the front. Lots of different pieces going on here, and they don't always have names, uh, because I cut my pieces apart into many different weirdness blocks. Then I have to sew them all back together again, that's why I have to remember to add seam allowance. And here I am top stitching that as well, using the side of my presser foot as a guide for that, and the same thread, but I do like to switch to a larger stitch length to do top stitching. I like switching from 12 stitches per inch, which is what I use to sew all my seams, to an 8 stitches per inch. Um, so that's the only like visual change I do. You can use a thicker top stitching thread or a contrast top stitching thread, of course. Sometimes I'm doing top stitching more to keep things smooth on the inside than necessarily even for the look of it. Although I do think it adds a sportier look to these sort of garments as well. And I'm just pinning my shoulder yokes on now so I can sew those on as well. And then I can sew my left front and right front together even now that everything is assembled. But again, I'm going to um, clip the curves on this few curves here in the very front, press that open and top stitch this first as well. Lots of pressing and top stitching involved. I'll even use the clapper. Look, what an idea. Every once in a while. And I will again top stitch those over on the machine. Again, using the same thin side of my little funny retro presser foot here as a guide to do that. It's about an eighth of an inch probably. Like so, and the other side as well. Then I can go ahead and line up again that center front making sure to line up the uh, point where this meets here in the center front, the uh, two different sides meet, I guess. The stripe meets the full iridescent side, because that is the most important part to get perfect, of course, here on the front. But again, I will press this seam open, and that's right, top stitch it. I'll even use the clapper again. Look at me being good for once and not burning my hands. It's an idea. But now I can go ahead and start constructing the backs. Same sort of idea. Here I'm going to sew my stripe to my side back and then I'll sew the end of that to that afterwards and again just after I sew each seam here I will press them open and top stitch them again same sort of process for sewing the backs together as well that one I hadn't aligned perfectly you have to align these so that the points hang off the edge uh, a half inch so that when you sew this because you're not sewing along the cut edge you're sewing a half inch in you know so it has to match a half inch in not necessarily along the cut edge if you've ever sewn with weird angles like this, you know what I mean. But give that a quick press. Again, tap it with a clapper even. Nice. Must have been feeling proper this day. Pin on the other bit of the under section here. Pin on the other bit of the waist section here. 
just keep sewing, and of course, doing my top stitching as well. Which does mean I have to refill more bobbins, because uh, for every seam that I sew, I have to sew it, you know, three times. Once, together, and then on either side, top stitching. Because it's me. And here's the seam that keeps tripping me up. Why, oh why, is it coming out imperfect? How rude. The back princess seam. Investigation is required. I'm sure I will have people giving me advice in the comments. Which, thank you if you do it nicely, I guess. <laughs> because sometimes, you know, people come after you. But that's what being public in any sort of minor way is about, honestly. I will, of course, be putting clips in here so that, you know, I can avoid as much bunching as possible. The bunching isn't happening in the sewing. It's in the fit or the pattern drafting, I suppose. I should mention that. It's uh, not a seam bunching situation. It's a pattern drafting imperfect fit situation. But my sides are matching up here nicely with this um, sec iridescent section on the front and the back. So, you know, really, one can't complain. If there's one flaw in the garment and the flaw is in the back so I don't have to look at it, it's not bad, honestly. But I can go ahead and sew my side seams and my shoulder seams together for the bodice now, the fronts and backs. And then I can go ahead and face the neckline. So let me sew, sew my uh, facings together. Again, I just serged the raw edge of the outside of this and then left the rest of it that will be encased in the neckline or in the shoulder seams as is because I didn't want to add any additional bulk because sateen like this is not... Uh, you can get ones that are a little bit thinner weight and ones that are a little bit heavier weight, but this kind of mid-weight sateen is on the heavier side uh, compared to other, I don't know, apparel cottons, I suppose. So try and avoid bulk when possible. It does mean it's a nicer, like smooth mm, fabric for making dresses and like uh, even sportswear separates, like making uh, jackets and skirts. You can make a suit out of sateen and it looks substantial enough, which is nice, um, especially if you want something in cotton as opposed to a wool suiting for whatever reason. But I'm just trying to make sure I'm exactly in that center front seam when I create the point of this V. And in fact, I'm just going to come in here and draw in this V with a pen as well, because I forgot to do that. And I want to make sure it's in the exact right place. Um, and it's quite deep V into the yoke here, so it's really easy to get lost. As you can see, it's much deeper than I was planning on putting it, so it's a good thing I got in here. But coming around that point, and then stitching the rest of the way, like so. I must have like got up and walked away <laughs> because there was a long pause there while I had done the point. It's okay, we can finish. Sometimes one has a kitten emergency, you know, in this house, you have to run up and see something they're cute that they're doing or hold one while my mom has to like wash the foot of the other one or something like that. But here I am just bag lining both of the layers of the peplum, by the way, to their lining so that I can clip these corners, turn everything right side out, and press these into place. But I can slip, snip the uh, V neckline of the front here. That's not nerve wracking at all. <clears throat> Very. But because there are curves going on in this neckline, I will go ahead and clip um, triangles out of the convex curves and then clip, clips into the concave curves. Um, this is just how I was taught to clip curves in fashion school. It's so that the fabric can fold nicely once you turn this right side out, basically. That's why that's done. I'm gonna give this a quick press and then I will take it over to the machine and do understitching as well, which apparently I did not get a clip of, but here I am folding everything to the inside now that it's been understitched and pressing and steaming the life into it, hopefully encouraging it to lay smoothly up here by the neckline and putting in a couple of pins where it interacts with seam lines because I can tack those spots later and then things will lie nicely and be a finished neckline. Woohoo! Like so, and then again I can finish these peplums now that they're sewn. I can clip the corners and turn these right side out. Um, again, the top waistline of this is open, and again where it is curved I will put clips. But the waistline is left open so I can turn these right side out, and because the waistline will be encompassed into the waist of my garment at large, you know? I could uh, base that again by, or like flatline the, that seam, I guess, by running it through the serger. I don't remember if I remember to do that or not. I don't remember if I remembered. That's right. I don't have the best memory, honestly. Short term or long term, really. I guess my short term memory is better than my long term memory. But I did make this dress over a week ago, and that falls into long term in my brain, so <clears throat> who knows what happened back then, you know? Every day is just my kittens are a little bit bigger, and I'm miffed about it, honestly. I'm just going to give this a nice crisp press so that 
the layers kind of meld together and become one lovely crispy peplum. It is the same set of steps that you just saw though, clipping the corners, turning right side out, even though one of these is a knit and one of them is a woven, they behave together no problem. I could have interfaced the stuff, but again, I'm trying to avoid bulk here in this bulky peplum, so you'll have to forgive me. But here's the iridescent layer, and here is the uh, top red layer here. They don't align perfectly at the waist, but that's because I added in a tiny bit of flare to the red layer, so it is a little bit more flared, so eventually when my hips are in here, it will stick up a little bit like this. And I'm just trying it on now and thinking, huh, am I going to like this peplum? I'm actually not huge, like historically, and I know this is controversial, I'm not a huge peplum fan. Here I am pinning this thinking, man, I should have made this, like planned this so that the red ended at the red, which I did not, but that's okay. But I'm going to pin this into place and hold up the bodice to myself as well, because again, I'm just not historically a peplum fan. But I'm coming around, you know? I'm being persuaded. I think part of it is that I'm not very tall. So anything that like makes my legs look in any way shorter, which I tend to find that peplums do, I don't, I don't love. I try and make, you know, simpler, the simpler and more sleek a skirt is in some ways, like the less visual bulk you're adding to below the waistline. And for many reasons, I like that idea. Um, but trying to make my legs look longer is useful to me proportionally because I'm only 5'5". Five five. Sometimes people are surprised by that. Yeah, I'm only 5'5". Five five. I think sometimes people think I am taller. Only with heels, pals. Only with heels. But I basted that peplum on once I had tried it and knew I liked it, and then now I'm sandwiching it in between the bodice and the skirt when I sew the waist seam of the bodice and the skirt together. So I'm pinning that. Again, matching up the side seams first and then matching up everything else. The skirt itself is plain, um, but the darts do match up in some areas with stuff. So just making sure everything is pinned properly with that peplum sandwich in between there. I just like to baste that first, especially because I wanted to kind of try it on and see if I liked it. But I can go ahead and sew that waist seam. Always makes me a little bit nervous, these waist seams, because it seems like it would be a high stress area. And I assume that it is, but I've never had one break on me. So I really don't know why I worry. I guess if I stopped worrying about it, that would be the time that one broke on me, like a thread snapped, you know? I try not to put a lot of stress on the waist of my garments. Um, so I make them you know, like the same size as my waist. So it's not like it's trying to suck me in ever. Usually if I want to like cinch my waist, I will use a belt, you know, to do that kind of thing. Not rely on my dress to do that, but you can, uh, especially if you're putting boning into these things, which is not a bad idea, especially for something this epic, having it highly structured inside wouldn't have been a bad idea, honestly. But now I'm putting gathering stitching into the top of my sleeve caps because eventually I'm going to have to set these sleeves in, but I am going to set them aside for a little while longer because I've learned on these giant sleeved dresses it's actually better to put the sleeves in last because the sleeves are practically as much fabric as the rest of the dress is. So it's better to put the zipper in actually first. So that's what I'm going to do here. So between where the zipper ends and the slit begins, I've sewn this dress shut down the center back and I'm using that seam allowance, which is one inch, as a guide to pin the rest of the like zipper seam allowance from the end of the zip up to the neckline open, mostly off camera here, which is again, super useful. Luckily you've seen me do zippers before if you're not new to the channel. And if you are new to the channel, as I always say, I'm so sorry because I tend to be kind of chaotic and <laughs> I'm sure it's not a good, I don't know what video would be a good introduction to me, but like a pick a random weekly video. It's probably not that, you know, but again, here, just finishing folding back my, uh, like back center back seam allowance so that I can set my zipper in here. I do like to do a lapped zipper or an overlapped zipper as opposed to a centered or railroaded zipper. Uh, sometimes people tell me that I don't center my zippers as if it is, should be surprised to me. And it is, uh, it's true. I do not. I do a lapped zipper instead. Just what I prefer. I find it easier. I used to do uh, centered zippers and I could never get them to look super clean. So I figure, not that my lapped zippers <laughs> either look exceptionally professional, but I just hope that if I sew a million more, one day I'll get there, you know? If there was a class specifically on zippers, I always say, I need to take it, you know? because they are still intimidating to me, even after years and years of sewing and fashion school, etc. I don't know. It's hard to make them look absolutely perfect. And yet other people obviously know the secret to this, which I do not have. Probably it's basting at first, which I'm just too lazy. But here I am using my zipper foot on the 99K to sew that first side down the right hand side of my zipper. I'm just sewing the folded edge right next to the zipper teeth here, using my zipper foot to do that and get real close. I can then go ahead and overlap the other side to cover that zipper teeth and that stitching line 
So I'm just overlapping this just enough to cover things and I will pin that into place. Of course, with that one inch seam allowance down the center back gives me plenty of room to do this. And then I will stitch this other side down again using my zipper foot, uh, but switching the side because the zipper foot, uh, like you actually have to like twist a screw on the back and move it over. But the zipper foot is just a specially designed presser foot that is designed so that you can get really close to the zipper. So it's, uh, you can use it for other things too. They taught us to use zipper foot for a couple of different finishes in college, if I'm remembering, which again, memory <laughs> does not serve me well. But now that my zipper is in, I will finally set in my sleeves. And luckily these have puff along the top. And also you can see here that I have the undersleeve also sandwiched in when I went ahead and surged around the top edge of that uh, outer sleeve to hold the lining down to the outer sleeve. I also inserted the undersleeve in there, this like fitted four way stretch undersleeve in there as well. So I could surge them all together at once. And then I'm just going to add in and finagle with the puff up here at the very top of this and then set in the sleeve, which is a double layered sleeve, but technically there's three layers of fabric because the outer layer of the sleeve has a lining. So this dress is heavy and a little bit bulky because there's just a lot of fabric going on, honestly. But hopefully you will agree the result is worth it. But here I am setting that sleeve in over on the machine. Sewing over my pins as is usual for me, especially with these fine pins. I, I always say that if you hit a pin, one of these fine pins, especially with a machine like this, which is a powerhouse, um, the pin will just bend. Like usually my needle doesn't even break because this machine is very strong. And actually my second to last step here is to hem my undersleeves. I had forgotten to do that before I set them in. Kind of a rookie mistake there uh, because it's more annoying to do now that they're attached to the dress, but I have just grabbed those tiny little wrists here and I'm turning that over half an inch and sewing that with the faux overlock stitch on my Burnett 35 machine instead so that this is a stretchy stitch. You could use a um, zigzag stitch as well if your machine doesn't have some of these fancier stitches. Uh, I don't know what half of them, I don't know what most of them do, honestly, but I enjoy using that faux overlock for things that I would use an overlock for, honestly. But here I'm just going to turn up my dress. I'm about an inch and an eighth here and fold my corners until they look how I want them, honestly. <sighs> Once again, not my strongest suit. Couture finishing. Someone take me to this class, please. I'm just going to press my hem into place, pin it, and then I will sit and I will hand stitch my hem. I will do that off camera. Um, I kind of use a prick stitch to do my hems, which is what I find works for me. And here is my finished red beetle wing sort of iridescent space queen dress. Uh, the sleeves on this thing are just absolutely epic because <laughs> I mean, they're like large kind of cape like sleeves to begin with and that are very long. And then to have them lined in this iridescent organza really just takes the whole thing to another level. Uh, luckily, like when their sleeves are down, my arms are down, you can't really tell how flamboyant this is. But when I have my arms up, of course, you can really get the flash of the beetle wing iridescence going on in here. And it is quite epic. And of course this peplum adds another level of theatrics to this dress overall, but I do think it is rather fun, something I would love to wear in Tomorrowland. Not that these slim pencil skirts are very conducive to getting off and on Space Mountain, but I digress. I'm not exactly positive what occasion this is for. You know, if someone invite, you know, you know how they invite women to sometimes like smash a bottle of champagne on a ship, sort of like the dress I would wear if they uh, had me like christen a rocket ship or something. You know, it's important to be prepared for all different types of occasions that could arise. But thank you as always for putting up with me and yet another color blocked, weird, shiny fabric dress. I promise once again, I will diversify my situation and make something else next time. I'll be back here with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye.